So welcome to the last talk of the day on OSS. What is ABI and why should they care? And like when I started to make this talk, I set the audience level to intermediate because I thought there's C and assembly, so it definitely should be intermediate. But after working on the slide, I realized that it, actually a lot of those are concepts. So I end up setting the audience level to beginner. And in practice, I think it ends up being somewhere in the middle. So if like half the audience walk away thinking this is too hard and half walking out thinking this is a bit too easy, then I think I've reached like the perfect goal. So with that said, let me begin with even more questions. So why does a compile program like you compiled 10 years ago would work on late, latest system? Um, you probably have to containerize it, otherwise it wouldn't work. But once you did containerize it, it will run on the latest system. So the, if this is the first time you think about it, like it, it might sound straightforward. Yeah, the program doesn't change, it should run. But if you think about the world 10 years ago, it's entirely a different world. So how can the program still run? And on the other hand, when you upgrade your system, um, it oftentimes, your program breaks. So why does this happen, and why does that happen? So the answer to both questions is actually the main objective of the talk, ABI. And so some self-introduction. I'm Xiongxi. i based in Taiwan, and I work for SUSE. I will mention SUSE maybe two or three more times. I hope that's like consider a healthy dose of marketing. So with that said, let's have some background. We actually will start talking about API first. So the application programming interface. Nowadays, when we talk about API, we usually think about the web API. For example, GitLab provides some API that you can access its repository. But API is actually more than that. Like you have Python, for example, if you want to use the Python range function, you can read their documentation and it tells you how to use it. Or you can have write hello world in C where you want to use printf. Well, printf has a documentation. And um, these are all APIs. But we're talking about ABIs for this talk, right? So what does ABI do? Like it looks suspiciously similar to API. Um, it's actually the application binary interface. And the application binary interface and application program interface does look quite similar. It shares application interface. And in this case, we actually care more about the interface part. So what exactly is an interface? And in this case, it's actually more like a specification or colloquially, I would say it's more like a guarantee. So the guarantee for GitLab is that GitLab have a tree API that when you call it, it will list the file in that repository. And Python have an API range that if you pass in two into it, it will start counting from zero. Oh, so uh, glibc, printf, guarantees you that when you call it, it will run to SDD out, and it will, will not just write to some random file in your file system and corrupts it. So these guarantees are actually what keeps a programmer like sleep at night, knowing things will work um, the next day when we wake up. So enough on the common part, but what's different about them? So one is binary, one is programming, and on the high level, the programming API part is concerning with the source code. The binary ABI is concerned with machine code. So source code, we're actually quite familiar. Um, here we have some source code in C that's a function called x square. Try to multiply x by itself and return it. So how about the machine code? Well, the machine code actually looks like this. Unfortunately, we're not machines, so I'll be turning this into assembly code. Assembly code is the textual representation of the machine code. So this might look quite unfamiliar. 
we can ignore this uh, for now. But just know that there's something that turns the, uh, uh, the source code into assembly code, and that is the compiler. So the compiler actually has, uh, I guess, a place and API. So now I'll try to serve you an example demonstrating ABI, the concept of ABI. The ramp up is slightly slow, so I hope you can bear with me for the moment, but let's see it. So say you have an application, and for application, you also have some library, because you can keep your main business logic in the application, and you keep your helper routine in the library, so you can either open source it and share it with others and basically make the world a better place. And in practice for the library, at least for C libraries, we actually split the library into two. You have a development header, which is the declaration of the library, um, the data structures and the function that it supports. And you have the share library, which holds the actual implementation. So what does the share library look like? Well, it actually looks kind of like this. So, this is x square we have seen before. It takes x and multiply it and return it. And here we have another program, which is our application. And it makes use of this x square. It calls it into x square and use the return value somehow. And notice that both actually share a data structure called point. So point will be placed in this development header. And to use it, you just have to include it in your program, both in the share library and the, your application. And there you can start defining what points look like in your main application. Here we define point to have x equals 2 and y equals 1. And in this case, since x is 2, and we pass this p into x square, so we actually get the return value of 2 multiplied by 2, which is four, so x2 is four. And for demonstration purpose, we try to index with x2. So this is actually not that special, we just index in, into an array that returns the index itself. So we're mostly done. So this is the final program. There's one small touch-up that just to make things more visible, we actually print calculating when the program starts, and this becomes quite important later. So just recall that. So now with the program in place, we can compile it. First, we compile the share library. I call it libgeo here. And after the share library is compiled, you can comply your main application. And when you run your main application, no big surprise here, two times two equals four, Array index at four equals four, and so everything just returns the return code of four. Okay, now for some more fun. Uh, say you decide that like C programmers are not fair, don't really like to type much, so instead of calling your function x square, you decide to call it x underscore two. And you couldn't do that. So after you make this change, you rename your helper library function, you recompile your helper library function, but you don't have, usually you don't um, compile your main application. So generally the main application will be on the system and when you update the package, the package itself changes the library, but your main application stays the same. So you go ahead and you try to run your main. Well, things break. It says like symbol error. So undefined symbol x square. This is an ABI breakage. So it's a breakage because there used to be a function that's declared in the helper library, but now it's gone. But you know what's in the name? Like you could rename x squared to x underscore two, but you could also change the parameters. So instead of taking structure p pointer, you can actually maybe want to take x directly. It's more efficient. So instead you do this. 
and you change your XR, you know, what could go wrong, and then you compile your shared library, run your main application again without recompiling. So this time, something different. So last time, the program won't even execute. There's no calculating going on. But this time, your program actually runs. It runs, but it crashes, So which is interesting. This is, of course, another case of ABI breakage. And it's not just function signature you can change. You could also change the data structure, right? So instead of changing the function, this time we decide that maybe point being two-dimensional is too limited. We're going three-dimension. And you feel like rebellious. You want to put Z in front of everything. You think Z is the best. And you try to recompile your shared library. Run your main application again. And this time, interesting, nothing crashed. It says calculating, but it returns to one. OK, so that's interesting. That is actually an ABI breakage. It changes the behavior of your program, but it doesn't always crash your application. And now it's going for a more conventional approach. It decided that, no, don't need to be so rebellious. Let's put Z at the end. And you do that. You recompile your shared library again, run your main application. And this time, interesting, nothing breaks. Like it says calculating, it returns four as you expect it, as if nothing has changed. So this case is actually an ABI compatible change. So why? Let me take a drink. So a look under the hood. So I promised there would be assembly and C. Um, here it comes. So there's two changes we try to make. One is we try to insert Z before everything and things break. And the other is that we try to put Z at the end and nothing breaks. So what's going on? Well, for that, we have to look at the assembly. So if you haven't tried reading assembly before, or uh, like this is the first time you're seeing assembly, it's actually not that hard to read individual assembly lines by themselves. So if you don't know assembly, you still probably know how to operate this, right? The calculator, trustworthy, handy dandy. And the CPU actually works kind of like that. So each assembly instruction is actually kind of and manual, you could imagine, telling you how to operate a calculator. So one thing that's really cool about our ordinary calculator is that it has a very, very handy function, line of function. And this is very useful, because when you're doing calculation, sometimes you want to have the calculation saved somewhere and use it again later. And instead of writing down on a piece of paper and typing it back again, the Calculator can actually save it for you. So the saving and retrieving of some values is actually what the CPU does as well. And in CPU language, we call this a store to register and retrieving the value a load from register. So CPU works really like calculator. It will retrieve a value from register, do some calculation, and then store it back into a register. So armed with that knowledge, we can try to look at the assembly in new light. I'll try to use my pointer, which doesn't really work. OK. So, so the first line, what it does, is actually a load. LD stands for load. And what it essentially does is that it tries to load x from a position that's 0. I'll, I'll go into more details. But after it loads um, x, it will put it inside the register called A0. And the second instruction, what it does, is that it will multiply A0 by A0 itself and store it back into A0. And then finally return A0. 
So what this does is essentially what we have in the source code, multiply x by itself. And now, I, with that, let's move on to something more advanced. So this is our main application. It initializes p with x equals 2 and y equals 1. So this is slightly more complicated. Um, what happens is that the CPU cannot really uh, put a value directly into a register. It kind of has to craft a value out of thin air first. So it's kind of like pressing 2 um, in the first instruction. It's kind of like pressing 2 on the calculator and storing it somewhere for later use. So what happened is that the CPU will first load value 2 into a register, A1 in this case. And after that is done, after you have created two, you store it somewhere. And that is a store for X. So again, you store this into some position zero. And after that is done, you move on to Y, because Y equals one. So you first have a load immediate of one, loading one into A1, then storing a1 into position 8, which is where y is at. So, so far, so good. All right, so notice that x is stored at 0, uh, position 0. So this is in agreement with what the share library does. When the share library loads x, it also loads from 0 position. So this agreement is, the, is one part of the application binary interface. This agreement that X can be accessed and stored at the zero position is the ABI. And that is something that, at least in the beginning, the application and the library agrees on. And if we move on, so for the, from the original data structure with X and Y, we move on to the more rebellious data structure layout with Z at the beginning. And if you compile your shared library in this case, even though you have not changed any part of the code, you actually arrive at something different. And the different part is this. So instead of loading X from the zero position, your code, your shared library, actually now try to load the uh, x value from the eighth position. Now you have something that's strange. And that actually disagree with your main application, because your main application was trying to store x into the zero position. And this is because they are now operating on a different ABI, and, the, and hence the ABI breakage. So instead of loading x, what your share library actually ends up loading is actually y. So it then grabs y, which is 1, and 1 multiplied by 1 index 1 is 1. So that's what happened. So like the complete talk on ABI, what consists of ABI, and why this, why that, is, I think it's more than a single talk. And it's more than what I know. But a quick summary is that on data structure due to C standards and memory alignment, um, the fields are placed at specific positions. So at the beginning, we have X placed at zero position and Y placed at the eighth position. But when you change the data structure, you actually insert Z into the zero position. And this push back all the data structure that come afterward. So X is now actually at the 8th position, and Y is actually at the 16th position. And so not just the access to X is broken, the access to Y is actually also broken. And on the other hand, so there's the other way we can change it, the convention one. When you insert Z into the end, the X and the Y actually stays the same. So they say it's the same position, and hence the change is ABI compatible. So solutions. 
what can we do when the API break? Well, the answer is actually surprisingly simple. You just recompile, like that's all. But recompiling is actually not that feasible. It's not just that recompiling takes a long time and a lot of resource, but for, for many cases, when you update the package, you couldn't just say to the customer that, hey, we update this package, please also recompile your entire application. That really doesn't just work. So instead, we have workarounds. So say, for example, you decide to change your x squared signature from taking a struct point into long. So in C++ and Java, they actually have something called name mangling. So instead of calling both function x squared, they actually embed the type information into the name. This is kind of like, not really how it works, but conceptually, this is what happened. So instead of both being called x squared, you now have one x squared that's, that's with name specifically saying it takes a point. The other is one that, the name for taking long. But in C, we don't do that. For C, we generally rely on simple versioning. The idea is actually quite similar. So when you change some function, you don't call it the same thing. And what we do is that we try to append a version number at the end of the name. So when you have your first act, uh, version of x squared, maybe it came out at version 0 0.1, you append this 0 0.1 at the end of the name. So further down the line, you decide to change x squared. Now this, you, you'll be done in a different version, and maybe in version 0.2. So what you do is you append the, uh, the version name again at the end. So this time you have two different x square. And the good thing about this is that since they have different name, the old code that was referring to the old x square can continue to work. And if new code is compiled, it will actually use x square at version 0.2. And this knowledge of simple versioning is actually um, integrated into most package manager. For example, with RPM, it actually knows what simple version are exported by a library. And similarly, when you're trying to install a package, for example, you're trying to install bash, RPM will know that, oh, bash in this case needs some symbol from glibc 2.25. So when installing bash, it'll make sure that the glibc on the system has the corresponding version that can support it. And, but the most usual workaround we have is actually just trying to make things compatible. So when making change, try to make the change API compatible. That's, that's actually sometimes a very difficult task to do, but that's what we end up trying to do most of the time. And so the, the former case can be seen as an, an example. So just don't try to insert fields somewhere else and keep the position the same. And it, it ends up actually harder than it sounds. And one of the te techniques that could be used for a shared library um, is to use something like opaque type which basically is that you do not tell your library user what type information you have. It's like they know nothing. So every time they need to uh, do something to the object, they actually had to call your library function where you have always the most up-to-date and consistent view on the API. Or another strategy you can try is just like, never change things. So, this sounds funny, but this is actually what's employed, um, the technique employed for the system call interface on the Linux kernel. For example, we have an open add system call, and it turns out that we need to add a new parameter, but we couldn't change the old one. So what happened is we create open add to syscall, which takes a new kind of parameter and half the old one stays the same. So um, not that, not that cool, but very effective. And, but all this that I've said is actually more like 
the people have to pay attention to keep ABI either, either unchanged or compatible. And that, like as much as we try to do that, things still change. So that's why we need something like ABI checker. And conventionally, ABI checker is usually some ad hoc script with some magic that try to do ELF and some parsing. But recently, there's a project um, called Lib Ab Abigail. This is actually from, uh, I think, by engineer from Red Hat. And it's a very cool library and tool for ABI. For example, it has a tool called ABI diff. So instead of the, your usual diff that try to find what changes in your source, source, source code, so it, it can actually find the difference in ABI instead. And I think this really has a lot of potential. I, I look forward to seeing it being used more. I think um, they have tried to run ABI difference on um, the Fedora packages to track any API breaking changes. All right, so back to the topic, why ABI matters? Or, or, or based on the title of the talk, why should you care? So by now you have probably like, no, like, when ABI breaks, things break. And it could either break quite visibly, like the case of missing a symbol. And breaking visibly is actually a very good thing. We want things to fail fast. On the other hand, it could also fail silently, like the case where it returns one instead of four. So imagine you have like million of transactions per second doing financial operation. And instead of billing your user four dollars, you'd bill them like one dollar, and you'll go bankrupt pretty fast. So that's that's definitely bad. Yep. And I think the, the even worse thing about ABI is that it might not be you that does the change that breaks things. So what happens with the ABI is there's a la uh, there's layer of dependency. So I'll try to go faster. Um, there is the, the ABI at the application level. It actually depends on the ABI at the library level, which in turn depends on the kernel ABI, and then depends on the machine ABI. So this is an example. For example, our, our main application is the application, and we have libgeo, which is, provides the, half the library ABI and runs on Linux kernel and runs on the Intel or AMD machine. So by now I've talked kind of about the, uh, the layer above, but let's talk a bit about the machine ABI level. So by machine, we usually refer to what CPU instruction your CPU is running. And one of the thing that could be considered at the machine level API is something called the call convention or colloquially, like how arguments are passed. So this is a table how different, um, different machines um, decide which argument are passed in which register. And we don't, look, don't have to look too much in detail, but let's say for some imaginary case that the CPU providers decide that we don't need that much register to pass the functions. Like four is enough, who needs six? and they decide to kill the registers and only left four. And this is a change in the machine ABI. So what happens? Well, with the change in machine ABI, actually everything above will, will break. And this is definitely bad. So it's pretty important to know that who guarantees the ABI. And the, and, um, the concept is, I guess, known as ABI stability. So for the machine level, this is guaranteed by the hardware vendors who sells the CPU. On the kernel level, it's by the Linux kernel developers. On the library level, it will be by similarly the library maintainers. But usually people don't just um, download the library, compile it, and download the kernel, compile it, and use it. Usually that's the job of the Linux distribution providers. So, hi. So that's SUSE is one of them. I promise I'll mention this just one more time. So we serve library and kernel 
and we serve them making sure that when the package update, they still provide the same set of ABI. And if you look at this thing, like it's, it's not really that hard. Like you just grab some version of the library, grab some kernel, and use it forever until the end of time. Like that will work, ABI doesn't change. And so I have some bad news for you. This is known as CVE, security issues. So security issues happen, and when that happens, you see there's some fix that's on a very new version. And you have, when you try to apply the fix to your very old code base, it really doesn't work. So we do very much work to make sure that even on old library and old systems, you get the latest fix, and at the same time, the ABI stays uh, stable. And another thing that we try to guarantee is something called the K8 kernel ABI. So it's not often talked about, but the Linux kernel actually has like two sets of ABIs. One is intent for the user space for the users, um, that is usually the system call. So in that interface, it's stable. But if you write a kernel module, you are not considered a user, you are a developer. And in that case, the ABI is actually not stable. So KABI is another thing that SUSE guarantees in addition to, to the usual kernel development, that we guarantee the kernel we provide has a stable ABI. Again, okay, last time. And now for some real world example of ABI in action. So one of the best examples we have now is called the year 2038 problems. This is when the Unix time, as we know, has reached the end of time. So because Unix, uh, the Unix timestamp on 32-bit system has only signed 32-bit, it will actually can only record the last date on um, January 19th of uh, 2038. And the problem with this is, uh, is that there's 32 bit, so very straightforward. We can solve the problem by turning 32 bit into 64 bit, like what could go wrong? And ABI breakage is there. So if you want to solve this problem, you have to recompile. And there's really no way around it. There's actually a talk yesterday on your uh, 2038 problem, which is a great talk. I recommend you should go find it. All right, so all of that is, that is kind of pessimistic, but let's try to look some real world example that shows the better of ABI. So one of a really good example are the emulators. For example, you might have heard of Wine, which allows you to run Windows application or games on Linux. And that is, that is doable because we know what API Windows provide and we're able to emulate it and thus the program can run. Or similarly, you, you might have to heard of QEMU, which can emulate different kind of CPUs. Or if you use Mac, maybe you have um, the M M series CPU that still can run uh, program compile for the Intel CPUs. Then that's because of that. And another pretty cool thing is actually the foreign function interface, otherwise known as FFI. So say, for example, you have some cool C function that you have and you use, want to use it in Python because you like Python. And this is actually doable. You could call a C function that's exactly the same C function you have in C in Python. This is doable because we emulate kind of, because we know what, C, uh, what ABI C uses. And it's not just Python. We can actually do a Ruby to C call or even the Java or Golang to C code, which is more expensive because of the ABI difference. And it's not just to C. Like if two programs can agree on the same interface, which is usually the, the interface that C uses, the ABI that C uses, you can have Python called Swift, you can have Julia called Rust, you can have anything. So I hope that ends on a more positive note. And now for some conclusion and takeaways. So, uh, so one thing about API is that when API breaks, things doesn't work correctly. And we're seeing is that you might not even notice. 
So the thing we can do is use caution, like changing things we care, but also hopefully we can start using more tools or the best case is you just recompile. And that's actually the end of my talk. May all your ABI be stable and never breaks. So I think I have time for maybe like one or two questions. All right. Wait. Oh, yeah, there, I think there's a mic. Oh. Um, hi. Uh, how would you recommend us to test for an impossible ABI breakage if I'm changing from a shared library from in my project that it's using for many applications? How could you recommend testing that CI for seeing if this ABI is going to break or not? So I, I actually don't have a good answer. I, I imagine you will run the lib AB, Abigail tool, the ABI diff in your CI CD, but of course then you'd need an old copy of your, um, of your library, which I'm not sure if that's so easily configurable, but if it's doable, uh, when you compile your new library, you run ABI diff, and I think there's some way to make it return an error when there's ABI difference. I believe that could be done. So you run ABI diff in your CI CD, and when it returns an error, like um, you know there's a failure, there's an ABI change. Thank you. Can I rely on the SO name of a library, or do you not recommend to do this? Uh, you mean like having a version number? Yeah, there's a version number inside the each uh, shared library, this SO name code. Uh, sorry, sorry, can you just repeat the question one more time? Uh, can I rely on the, I say each shared library has some meta information inside, one of this is this SO name, and normally the RPM system depends on this. Uh, can, I, can I rely on this, that the, the developer of a standard library is increasing his SO name if he makes an API change? So uh, if I get your question correctly, it's like, can you rel rely on the library from... Um, Some standard libraries. From what? A C library or something. Okay, like so generally you have to trust the library maintainer on that. Like when they make a change, they will also make a version change. That is actually a human process to ensure. And we, we really have to trust the library maintainer on that case, I believe. Okay. And do you check this then on, on, on the SUSE side also that in your distribution, your so, as a, the packages, the maintainers of the packages you are using uh, sticks to this rule? So yes, so we, that, that is also a manual process, like making sure that you have compatible change. Okay, thank you. So I believe the time is actually up. I don't want to hold anyone um, further than necessary, but you're welcome to come to me here for further discussion. And I'll also be at the Linux Prompter for the next few days. So hope to see you guys again.